Welcome to the Orlando Sentinel's editorial board interview for the Osceola County School Board. Today, we'll be talking to Angel Koba, an Army veteran who is currently attending Valencia College, um, Anthony Cook, a teacher and school counselor, and Julia Tavares, an Osceola County teacher as well. Um, and we will go ahead and get started with our questions. Jay, you want to wanna take the lead? Sure, absolutely. Um, the Osceola County School District received a B rating again this year with only one D school and no Fs. And that's certainly something worth celebrating. But the majority of Osceola schools, 40 out of 73, are graded C. What is your plan for improving those schools? And we will start with Mr. Koba. Hi, um, thank you for the question. Such a great question. First, I want to go ahead and recognize and give, you know, a silent uh, applause to Osceola for doing such a such a great job. Such a great job. Um, um, so what I would do is look at leadership, right? Because leadership trickles down all the way to, to the teachers, to the teachers. Um, and so uh, we have to go ahead and and see how leadership is performing at the top, uh, principals, vice principals, super um, supervisors, um, and really look into where uh, we. Have. So, from my understanding, is a lot of a lot of children are just um, getting by to the next grade level, just just getting by. And so um, it's not really setting them up for success. A lot of children have uh, reading, uh, low reading scores and low math scores. So by, you know, accommodating more and putting more, a little bit more of the budget towards the resources we already have uh, to, to empower our teachers to do uh, a, a good job, uh, they're already doing a good job. Um, I, I feel like we could, we could lead towards achieving an, uh, an A as a school district. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Same question. Well, just like Mr. Koba, first and foremost, we want to recognize the hard work of our educators. Having been my whole professional career being in Osceola County, I've been in the trenches. I still am in the trenches. I go in um, and help volunteer. I, I, I have friends that are um, educators. I know how hard they're working. Um, so it's important to recognize that. And with that school grade, we were only a few percentage points away from actually may, uh, receiving an A for our school district. So we have closed a significant gap over these last few years as we have tried to um, get to that A rating. So there's been a lot of work that has been done. And when you go back and you look at our scores, um, you know, school grades are covered in a few areas. It's our achievement levels across all subject areas, our grad rate and our acceleration rate. Our grad rate stayed the same. Acceleration rate went down slightly, but we had learning gains across all of our subject areas. There was only one grade um, that did not have learning gains, but they remained the same as last year. And that was fourth grade math. So I want to give a shout out to all of our teachers and educators in Osceola County because they've been doing a fantastic job. But as it relates to how we're going to move from a, a B to an A, we have to trust in the evaluation process that we have. You know, once we get those scores in, we want to evaluate what programs we're using, make sure that they're being effective. Um, if our teachers are being effective and if not, what are the supports that we can provide them to make sure that we're closing the gap um, in their teaching? And uh, at the end of the day, we know that's going to trickle down to students and we got to burn the other end of the candle and recognize that if we can strengthen our VPK programming, that's going to help set a firm, strong foundation. So partnering with the Early Learning Coalition um, in that process is going to help. And the thing is, I don't know if you knew this, but only 20 percent of our students that could be in VPK are actually attending VPK. So one, we got to make sure that we strengthen that with them. And then two, we want to make sure that we get others in that uh, space as well so that we can start that early foundation and then that will carry on throughout the rest of the grade levels. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Ms. Tavares, same question. Yes, I believe that we need to engage in better partnerships 
in families, teachers, and community leaders. Um, as it was mentioned before, leadership is, is very important. So, you know, the teachers do work really hard and there have been improvements, but there is the problem of children being promoted to the next grade level when they're not even equipped at grade level. And so we really need to um, spend more time in seeing where the gaps are and filling in those gaps and looking at the data and seeing exactly what that child needs because there's many resources that are available, but then it takes a long time for them to receive those services. And so I would like to um, make programs so that parents know, okay, if you see these skills that your child is not meeting, these are the different resources and these are the different techniques that you can use to help your child. So, so despite the B grade, uh, U.S. News and World Report shows that among elementary school students, only 46% are proficient in reading, only 40% are proficient in math, and those are significantly lower than other Central Florida districts. What should the district do to improve those numbers? And we'll start this time with Mr. Cook. Yeah, that goes back to what I said, trusting that evaluation process. So looking at those programs, um, you know, we have an evaluation system that's in, in that's set for our teachers um, to see how they're doing in the classroom. So we want to evaluate those things. We want to make sure that we remove those barriers for teachers um, and equip them with the tools that they need and get out of the way so that they can actually do what they've been trained to do, and that's teach. Uh, but like I said, going back to that original question, we while we are not where the state is, we are seeing those gains. And what I meant by that was our kids are actually on grade level at every grade this past year, with the exception of fourth grade math, um, where we saw those learning gains. So uh, that's that speaks to the work that our district leadership has been doing, as well as our teachers have been doing. And we just want to continue to build uh, upon that. Uh, with our programming, with our instruction, with our strong home to classroom connection. It takes a village truly. So we want to make sure that parents are involved in that, um, as well as our teachers being able to live with that strong instruction for our students and that also our students are engaged. Um, but when we compare this to where we were after we came out of COVID, we've come quite, quite a long way since then. And we just want to continue to build on that momentum moving forward. Thank you for that. Ms. Tavares, over to you. What would you do to improve the reading and math scores? Well, um, basically we need to, like I said prior to, see where the gaps are. Is it, is it that they don't know how to blend when they're reading? Is it that they don't um, understand what they're reading? We have to see exactly where the problem lies. And um, it's very important that we we really look at each child because each child grows at different um, levels. They're different types of learners. And so we need to tailor our teaching to the have differentiated teaching for the child to be able to grasp the skill sets that they are learning. Thank you, Mr. Koba. Same same for you. Yes. Um Thank you very much. Um, so again, it would have to, I, I think, involving parents, right? Uh, partnering with parents once again um, plays a critical role in any any student's academic achievement. I, I believe it truly starts with a partnership with parents and their and their children and and with the teachers, right? We have to have that open line of communication because if there is none of that. Um, we won't know. We won't know how to better progress the children who are, um, you know, having difficulties in reading or or in math. Um, so, like like it was said before, uh, we have to look at exactly uh, what kind of student, right? Whether it's a student that suffers from language deficiencies or 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 not, we have to look at what the internal problem is and how to navigate. Yeah, um, by equipping our our teachers to with tools to help our children, uh, you know, overcome that hurdle uh, if they're they're facing you know struggle with with reading and and with math. And it was brought up earlier 
um, that partnership with uh, VBK, I, I honestly, in my opinion, I believe that to avoid all of these problems, uh, problems will always occur, but to minimize the problems, right? I believe that it starts at the VPK level, um, getting the the babies, you know, actively engaged with reading and math. And by the time they hit first, second, third, they're probably already at the twelfth grade reading level and math level. So it starts when they're when when they're young, and empowering our our parents more, uh, opening uh, a better line of communication, um, all these towards uh, that improvement in academic achievements. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, the most recent re um, rankings from U.S. News and World Report also show, and this is the last question about rankings, I promise, um, that Osceola's student-to-teacher ratio is worse than the state average, which is 18 to 1. In Osceola, it's 20 students to every teacher. Um, why is that? And what are your ideas for recruiting and retaining high quality teachers? And let's start with Ms. Tavares. Well, we have seen a population boom in our district. And so we don't have the infrastructure and we have a lot of children. <laughs> so particularly I've seen in my particular classroom, I have 25 students. I've seen other teachers have 30 students. So yes, we, we do have a high student to teacher ratio. And so we do need to um, help our teachers by retaining them and, and helping them be successful in their careers, um, providing the, the support that they need and also um, the, the tools that they need. Uh, sometimes, as, as you know, um, teachers work many, many hours, many, many hours. And so we, we also like to be encouraged. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Koba. So there's a shortage of teachers, not just in Osceola, but across the state of Florida and across the entire nation. Um, in my opinion, I believe to uh, recruit and retain, we would have to change the school culture, right? Nobody wants to go to a job environment, right? Go to work and, and you know, have it be a hostile one, right? Whether uh, it's our teachers not getting along with their colleagues, right? Or teachers, um, you know, not being able to uh, deal with undisciplined children. So that that plays uh, a key role in recruitment and retention. Um, and apart from that, we have to, you know, emphasize an offer. I know it's not at the local board uh, level, but I would love for a lobbyist to go out to Florida and grab those funds, right, to um, to lobby to increase teacher pay and compensation. Right, because it's not enough, especially with the cost of living. Right, the cost of living doesn't balance out all those uh, uh, hardworking teachers that work 24 hours on the clock. Really, when that bell rings, they go home and and, and they're still working because they have to, you know, finish grading whatever you know what was left on you know the uh, for the work today and then prepare for tomorrow's assignments and and whatnot. And then we also have to find a way to prioritize work-life balances. Right and allocate much of the budgeting towards um, professional development programs and, and supportive mentorship programs and, and really take care of our teachers' mental health. Um, with all of that, I feel that it could decrease turnover rates, which will lead to um, academic achievement for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. I was going to say, don't forget me. Don't forget me. No. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> uh, that's a, it's a great question and it's multifaceted. So let's touch on some of the, the layers of this. Recruitment in our dish, uh, retainment in our district. Did you know that we're, we actually have one of the largest retainment rates in the state? It's over 90%. So we actually do 
uh, retain our educators. And as it was mentioned previously, this is a national problem, right? Education is, is bleeding uh, somewhat. However, in Osceola, we do retain over 90% of our of our teachers and we've done some innovative things you know we've recruited internationally we've gone nationally uh, across the united states trying to find teachers um we have our own homegrown program in uh, future Te uh, future teachers academy which is uh, through valencia and ucf i actually have a few of my former students that are teachers that have gone through that program that we've been able to retain and then we have partnerships you know we have things like our home hometown hearers buyers program to try to cut that cost of living uh, for teachers to be able to afford housing as we know it's absolutely bananas right now so we want to continue to create partnerships like that where we can be innovative and creative to help cut that cost of living um because as it was previously previously stated we only have a certain bucket of money as a district right and there's also a certain bucket of money at the state level and there's only so much that can go around so yes we want to work with lobbyists to try to get funds from our state, but we also want to be innovative and collaborative and create finding programs that will help cut those costs. The other part of this is it's a top down approach. We want to make sure that as a leadership, we are setting the model for what collabor healthy collaboration and problem solving looks like, right? So we want to be able to do that at the board level. And then we want to be, make sure that we are inspiring and motivating our teachers. Listen, a little goes a long way when you're talking about educators. So we do want to take the time and we want to recognize our employees. We want to have incentive programs that uh, are, are for them as they continue to do the great work that they're doing with our children to try to make them as successful as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will move on with the next question. Um, are you satisfied with the performance of Superintendent Mark Shanoff? Um, and if there was a vote to retain him, how would you vote? And we'll start that with Mr. Koba. So from attending um, the board meetings, right, going on two years now, whether I'm in person or, or live um, on, on, on the YouTube, yeah, I, I gotta say I, I I'm impressed. You know, I have a I have a son that goes to school in Osceola County, and honestly, um, when he first started off, I believe there was a another superintendent, um, and things weren't the way uh, they look now. You know, he's 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 made huge strides. He communicates uh, almost all the time with parents now, right? he has like an open door policy he's very vocal at the school board meeting he's just a different uh kind of leader a leader that you know it, it, it drives parents to you know to to get involved and so if i were to vote to retain him i i would i would vote to retain him yes thank you mr cook we'll go with you next yeah, I see no reason why we wouldn't retain Dr. Shanoff. Um, I mean, you know, as soon as he got in, he had his 90-day uh, plan. Uh, he executed that plan. I think some of the things from that plan that I, I've been impressed with, I've attended some of these. You know, he does his community roundtables. He goes to our schools and uh, receives face-to-face uh, -face feedback from our parents, what's happening in the school, what's happening in the community. And then he takes that back to the leadership team to see what needs to be addressed and how we can address those things. And the other thing that you got to love about Dr. Shanoff is he is not just engaging with parents, but he's engaging with students. I don't know if y'all seen him up at Oxa this past year, uh, dancing with the kids and stuff. So he's out doing things like that. He uh, even was out with our, our custodians and our HVAC team, uh, helping them with, with work that happens around the district. So what I love the fact that he's rolled his sleeves up and he's got his hands dirty with all the different stakeholders in our community from parents to students to our educators to um, our workers all of that right so um and under his helm this year as i said we saw learning gains across all subject areas with the exception of one great level so so far so good i see no reason why we wouldn't retain him so he has my vote to stay thank you mr Tavares. Yes, I have seen a, a difference. Um, I remember the previous superintendent uh, as my daughter uh, graduated high school from this district. And so, yes, he has made some some dif some significant differences and improvements. I would definitely keep him. 
And at the same time, I want to make sure that we continue to improve because there's always room for growth. And as you know, our district is growing and our population is growing, we, I, I expect more for the community. So I expect more from our leaders. Great, thank you. Next question regards cell phones. Should should Osceola County adopt a blanket ban on cell phone use in schools? And if, if not, where, where should the limit be? What what are your thoughts on cell phones in schools? And we will start with Ms. Tavares. Well, as a teacher, <laughs> I believe as a teacher, I believe that uh, cell phones are a distraction. So let's put the cell phones away. Let's have more social interaction and, and let the students really focus on the present, the moment, those experiences that are shared as they're interacting with one another and having the, the, stu uh, the student led centers and, and actively engaging and participating and, and, and being creative and being motivated. It's just, it's good to see them engaged and working together. Thank you for that. Mr. Coba, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Being in 2024, goodness, every child has a cell phone these days, right? Even if you're two or 10 or 11. Um, I, I gotta say that it does hinder, you know, uh, learning, right? It's a big distraction in the classroom. So I wouldn't say uh, no for phones being on, on the campus, right? But, um, and, and that's just because, you know, uh, every every case is different, you know. Might uh, for a, a, a child might might need their phone because of something in the emergency with their health or something. So we can't fully say no, uh, no cell phones on school. However, in in the classroom, I believe that this is just a military mindset of mine. Uh, in boot camp or any field training exercises that uh, I've gone through, when we had a phone, we had to go put it up, right? And so I I feel like that thing, it, it works. We're actively engaged, right? And we have to be mission ready. In this case, mission ready for our students to continue to, you know, uh, to learn and and to, and for the teachers to have a 100% focus on teaching. And, you know, uh, usage in the classroom with the phones definitely causes distraction. Uh, children need to socialize more. I feel that the use of the phones should be in the classroom, but even then, um, during, I mean, not in the classroom, in the cafeteria, I'm sorry, during lunchtime. Um, but even then, uh, you know, when everybody gets a break from class, they all socialize. So um, minimum usage throughout the day, definitely not in the classroom. Um, that's my, that's my take on that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Cook. What are your thoughts? Well, I know that the district currently has a policy set in place, so I support our stance and I respect the stance of other districts. I know that Orange County, they have a, a no tolerance for cell phones. I know Seminole is trying to move to something like that. Um, my main focus for students is that they are engaged in instruction from bell to bell. So whatever policy we need to put in place for that to happen, I'm going to support that. And it helps uh, that I have three kids, one just recently graduated that are in our school systems. And I remember the first week of this policy that they had the experience and they were complaining about it. You know, they're teenagers, they're gonna complain about it. But within a couple of weeks later, my daughter says, dad, you know what? Kids are more engaged in class. They're more active. And I was like, how does lunch look? What are y'all doing at lunch? Are y'all running to your phone? She said, no, dad, actually we're just hanging out and we're talking. So we're getting feedback even from our students that they don't even really want to be on their phones when we give them the freedom to be on their phones during lunchtime. So I'm good with the, the stance that we have right now. Um, and I'm looking forward to see what year two brings with that. One can make the case that Dr. Shanoff implementing that this year helped with those learning gains that we've seen across all subject areas. So I think there's a strong case for that. And uh, so excited to see what happens this year with that policy in place as well. Thank you so much. Um, 
I'd like each of you to assess the way Osceola County is handling challenges to books and other educational materials with groups like Moms for Liberty challenging books on the basis of sexual content, even if it's a very small part of the text, or what, what is described by our governor as woke ideology. Um, what changes, if any, would you recommend to Osceola's policy? Are you satisfied that this is being handled fairly? And let's start with Mr. Cook. Well, you hit me with that tough one there, huh, Chris? Um, I, I, I have, so my last year at the district was uh, when this really started to trickle down. Um, it was rough going in the beginning, but over these past uh, this past year or so, it's been a little bit more smooth selling. Um, so here's the thing. The state has uh, legislation and, and guidance in this. So we're going to follow what the state says, right? And I think it's important if parents have an issue or a concern that they have a voice and they can lend that voice. And then it's our duty to investigate that. And if we deem it inappropriate, then we remove those things uh, from the shelf. So I think our media center specialists and our uh, teachers are doing a great job of that. I've, I've been in meetings, like I said, that last year where we we got the guidance, we went back to our classrooms, we went back to our shelves, we did what we we're supposed to do. And um, students have the option to uh, explore those things and parents have the uh, voice to say, I don't want them to be a part of that or I do want them to be a part of that. So I'm okay with where we are as a district right now. And if uh, there are complaints that come forward and we're, we're out of compliance um, or we're, we've misstepped, then um, we'll do our best to make sure as a district that we investigate that and, and make the necessary adjustments. Ms. Tavares, same question. Yes, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm glad that we have the, uh, the laws that we have right now for the state and I'll, I'm all about following the law, making sure that our books are age appropriate and giving the parents the choice for their child's education. You know, what is it that they're, that the parents want for their child? You know, every parent uh, wants to raise their child in a different way and they should be able to without, you know, others being affected. Mr. Koba. That, that's a great question. Um, what's it called? You know, it must be age appropriate. Uh, I I don't think it should spill any sort of like hate, violence, or any verbiage that could endanger that student or other students. Um, with that being said, parents should always know what their children are being taught or what is on the bookshelf. And parents are always encouraged to express their opinions, whether for or against it, right? Um, because, you know, they are the parents and we are the educators. So um, parents are the stakeholders at the end of the day and to weigh in on controversial topics such as sexuality and and um, gender is important. Um, apart from that, I don't see why we should uh, violate Florida law. You know, the Florida legislator and the governor has already implemented legislation, right? As it was said earlier, as a guidance. And so as a school board member and as a school district, we should always comply with, with the law and never, ever violate law. Um, and yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll uh, ask the next, the next question. Is Osceola County doing an adequate job of providing age appropriate sex education to students? And I'll start with Mr. Koba for that one. It, I, I believe that they are, um, and you know the children are much older, and so it's a, it's important to, uh, to be educated, um, in, in that kind of uh, uh, topic. Um, I I went to high school ten years ago. I graduated from OHF, and I believe I was a sophomore or or junior when I had health class, and there were teaching about you know uh, uh sexes and stuff like that so i found it informative it's stuff that i didn't 
do on my own. You know, I didn't do my own research on that stuff. And um, because it was so informative, it led me to not do not do things that, you know, it's frowned upon. So I I believe that the school district is is still 10 years ago and now still doing the right job. Thank you, Mr. Cook, same question. Yeah, so as a teacher, I actually had to teach <laughs> sex ed to students. So I have firsthand experience and with my children going through the the Osceola school system, I have that experience. And I think here's the key. The key is to be open and to communicate with parents the choices they have in their child's education, right? And as it stands now, the state has guidelines and provides curriculum for how this is taught. Um, it is typically done in a biological fashion. So it happens at the transitional years from uh, fifth grade to middle school. And then when they uh, leave middle school and become high school, and we we have followed those guidelines and we haven't stepped uh we haven't misstepped as it relates to those guidelines so i am okay with what we are currently doing i'm also okay with the the fact that parents as we communicate what is being taught to their children parents have the same here to say i'm okay with this so i'm going to send my kids to school for that and i'm not okay with it so as it relates to when you are teaching that my kids will be um removed from class for those periods of time. So I think that that relationship that we have with parents allows them the freedom to choose if they, they're okay with that and if we're not. And again, we are following what the state has told us to follow. So I'm okay with what we're currently doing. Thank you, Ms. Tavares, what's your answer? So yes, I, I also believe that transparency is key and um, parents get to choose their children's education so as long as you know the parents are are fully aware of the education that their child is going to receive and they're okay and we're following uh state laws you know each each family has the choice and um that's the key transparency if everybody is 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 aware and fully knowledgeable that it's going to be age appropriate then everybody can make their own decision Thank you so much. Um, and I wanted to make our last question. I, we could we could ask more and more and more questions, but um, but we did promise. Um, but it's something that I find everybody just loves to talk about, and um, it's the fact that Osceola County offers its students many career and technical programs, 16 career clusters, the Career Pathways Program that is a partnership with Orange County and Valencia State, the, um, the Countywide Scholarship Program. Um, there are, there is always a question, of course, as to whether um, students across the county have adequate access to all these wonderful programs. So I'd like to ask you about that and if there are any areas of study that you'd like to see added. And we will start with Ms. Tavares. Well, yes, even though that we do provide a, a very various courses on different career paths, um, I, I believe that there are some um, courses that are limited in our district. Uh, for example, my, my daughter was interested in the culinary department and they were only at the Valencia College, they were only offering the basic courses. The more advanced classes were uh, being done at the other campuses, which for us living in this district was a far, you know, far drive. And so I, I do believe that there is room for growth in that aspect that we can um, bring more programs here um, and not just the basics. And, um, and, and I was also a part of one of those programs and my daughter and I, we did the mechatronics program in Valencia and we did it as a mom and daughter duo. And we even uh, got into uh, their Valencia articles and you know took pictures together. So it was a, a really nice bonding uh, moment for us. And, and so I encourage, you know, whether you're young or, or even advanced in age, you know, there's no limit to learning. 
and I'm all about encouraging uh, and, and building passion for learning in, in everyone. Thank you so much, Mr. Cook. Chris, this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Um, I believe that Osceola does a phenomenal job. There is always room for improvement, but again, let's let's just rep, let's just state the facts real quick. Did you know that we have almost a hundred CTE pathways across all of our high schools? We have fifty across all of our middle schools. Right. So there are a ton of opportunities. Plus, we are a choice district. So if we don't have that program on your side of town, you can choice and get on this side of town to come uh, to those programs. But it's not just CTE. Really, what we're trying to do, and we established this about six, seven years ago, we call it SDOC 4E. We recognize that all kids are not just going to go your traditional four year route, which is where the CTE pathways really came in, which is your college pathways. We identified that there are four options for kids. They'll either enroll in a four-year, two-year technical college, enlist in the military, seek high-wage employment, or take an expiration year working with our vetted organizations. And what we found is if we help students identify that pathway upon graduation and they have a confirmed plan in one of those pathways, after graduation, two years, within two years of graduation, over 90% of them follow through with that plan. So think about how that affects our students, their families, and then our economy, how we're strengthening that, right? So I was a part of the original program, the Got College that we launched in 2011, 2012, that morphed into Got Careers, that morphed into the Osceola Prosper, which moved us from 61st in post-secondary uh, attainment to third in the state for post-secondary attainment. So we're always looking to approve. We're always looking to uh, create those partnerships. And we have several pipelines when I was the coordinator of college and career services that we created for our CTE pathways. So yes, we do a great job and yes, we can even do better. And I'm excited to potentially be sitting as a board member, continuing to do that work with our community stakeholders and members to provide those work-based learning opportunities for our students across the district. Thank you so much for that one. Thank you, Mr. Koba. Such a great question and the uh, questionnaire, uh, just like Mr. Cook, this this holds dear to my heart. And that's because not all students are destined to go the traditional route. And I love to use myself, for example, I wasn't destined to go the traditional route, um, but I felt compelled to because that was sh that's what everyone was doing. They were going straight to a four year college. And so I thought to be successful, I had to go to uh, college and try to become a doctor and stuff like that. So um, Korean technical programs, you know, uh, it is receiving and should continue to receive the the attention, right, to move students uh, forward after graduation to continue to pave their pathways to achieve success in life. Um, I love uh, the tech route. I have a class A license. I was in the military. Uh, I have my security D and G license. That's secu um, and I, I've done warehouse jobs. I was even going to get into plumbing, you know, just because I I, I love it. There's a need, and there's a necessity for trade work, um, uh, in, in, in out here in the real world. Uh, there's not a lot of skilled people, um, out here. So by continued on continuing to, um you know, recognize children that want to go that route excites me because, you know, we have children the traditional route that are going to succeed. And then we have uh, children that don't want to go to college, but they want to go the technical route. They're going to succeed because the the it's not expensive, right? And we, if the school district pays for that at the junior, junior level, senior level of high school, right? They graduate, they're state certified, they're licensed. All they need to do is get employed you know, making $40,000 or more with salary full time. And if they need more education, I'm sure their employer will provide uh, just that. And so as a board member, I, I would love, 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 love uh, to continue to continue to improve um, accessibility as well, because I, I, I know students in, in that live in Poinciana uh, can't drive all the way to New York City. So finding accessibility is also key to making sure that we accommodate every child um, 
that has different interests, right? Um, and not forget that um, because that plays a role in academic achievement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we, in just a minute, I'm gonna ask each of you to make your closing statements. But first, I'd like to remind our readers that the Sentinel will be endorsing in this race, but we ask our readers to not make that their stopping point. Each of these candidates has social media, has websites, um, is out at events, um, doing forums. There are a lot of opportunities to, to learn about their platforms, meet them. And, um, and so we encourage you to, to, to do your own homework, look at everybody's platform, and ask yourself who best fits your own values and would be the best representative for you on the Osceola County School Board. So, and, and just remember that no matter what you decide, August 20th is election day. So on or before then, you can, uh, you can um, visit an early polling place or, or um, come out on election day and, and vote. Now, I did do a random, um, random generator and our first uh, person to make our closing statement is Ms. Tavares. So I am, um, like I previously mentioned, being a teacher and um, I'm a, a mom, I'm, I'm really passionate about my community. And um, I believe all children want to feel safe and that they are really genuinely cared for. And as we build, actively build those relationships between the families and the teachers and the community leaders, I really believe that our students' performance will improve. And so, um, like I said, I am very passionate about helping those um, in my community. And, and, and I wanna see, I wanna see growth. There's so much that we can be doing and we all have to work together. It's not a, just one department or one facet of things. We all have to come together. And unity, in, in unity, we are stronger. And so um, I, wanna, I wanna say uh, that it, these elections are very important. And like you said, everyone has their platform. And so please do more research and, um, and, and vote your values. Thank you so much. Mr. Cook, you are up next. First of all, I want to thank you for having us on here and, and hosting this forum. I want to thank Angel and Julia for being on here. Julie, we haven't got to meet yet, so it's good to hear hear you and hear what, what you're wanting to see happen in our community. So I, I'm, I'm excited for uh, this race and I'm excited for whoever, which one of us gets um, you know elected for this position. As it relates to me and why I think I should be the school board member, Listen, I have 20 years of education and those 20 years have been dedicated of the 20, 75 percent of that has been dedicated right here in our district, having opened up Bella Lago Academy um, and, and being a teacher there, then becoming a school counselor, then moving over to Point Anna High School and helping Point Anna High School become our first Abbott National Demonstration School and become a model school for CTE pathways, as well as college and career readiness, which then got me. Uh, promoted to the district where I've served the last five years as the coordinator of college and career services. I've been doing this work for the last two years or, or two decades, and uh, I'm proven. Uh, I've been nominated as teacher of the year. I've been nominated as state innovator of the year. I just won a Vanguard award for uh, my work in education. I sit on the board for early learning coalition, as well as all the access networks from the local to the national level. Um, I am excited and passionate about this work to see that every student is future ready. And I know that that starts at home and what we give them in our classroom, which means I need to also take care of our educators who are delivering that instruction. So I, I'm a people person. I have those connections within our community. I want to continue building on those connections and leveraging those connections to position our students to be the best that they could potentially uh, be so that they can be successful once they leave our K-12 space. So I think with that attitude, with that passion, with that experience, with that knowledge, this is just an extension of that work. And I'd like to take that to the school board and, and see that our district becomes the A district that I believe we truly are. Thank you so much for this opportunity. 
Thank you. And Mr. Koba, could you close us out, please? Absolutely. Um, first, thank you for allowing me to come before you and, and the people of uh, our community to speak about why I'm running for office. Uh, thank you for having Mr. Cook and Ms. Tavares on here as well. Uh, we're all fighting to, you know, we all have a passion and that's to serve our community. And we all bring great ideas to the table. I'm running for school board because I know our school district has areas where it needs improvement. And my top goal as a board member is to improve, number one, the safety and security for all schools, not just in Pointiana, but in all of Osceola County. I've been an advocate for that. I, I've gone to the board meetings, um, you know, time after time, uh, going before the board and telling them, hey, parents have these big concerns and it's safety and security. Often parents have to take their children out of schools and homeschool them or put them at a private school because of bullying issues. That's a big thing going on. And so I would like to address um, cyberbullying as well. Uh, review emergency protocols, incident um, reportings, right, and 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 reconnect the partnership uh, with um, the sheriff's office to have more SROs on campus to create a positive environment. Education, you know, I would love to see off the old school district become an A, and but and and that would be huge. That would be huge recruitment and retention. We can't get an A unless we fill those shortages and continue to do the good job that Osceola School District is already doing by retaining them. So we just have to uh, hire more, right? And prioritize the teachers, right? Work-life balance, you know, uh, put them in development workshops for them to grow personally uh, and, and, and with the work in their field, right? Uh, technical education, continue to put uh, a strong focus on career and technical education. And most importantly, the physical discipline, right? We need transparency. Uh, board members have to be mindful that the, the, the $2 billion budget that we operate belongs to the taxpayers, right? So we have to create a plan where we minimize unnecessary spending, right? Perhaps, perhaps cut, I, I don't, I hope I don't, get uh frowned upon for this but perhaps cut administrative cost a little bit manage assets the right way right always make sure we always have to make sure that our academic um return on investment is always prioritized number one um once again thank you for having me here tonight um it's been my honor thank you And I would say it's very much been our honor. We we enjoyed this tremendously. 